So here's the agenda that we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to try to demystify a little bit of the complexity that surrounds sensor cylinders uh, and some of the gray matter that uh, is in between the sensor itself that's in the cylinder and the control modules and the applications and the valving and whatnot. So really our intent today is uh, not to uh, give everybody a, a, a great, great technical degree of understanding of, of all the components because there is, there's a lot going on here, but to help make everybody more comfortable and I guess be mindful of different considerations that, uh, that you have to work through when you're thinking about implementing a, a smart cylinder or a, or a linear position sensor. And in line with that, we have um, someone who I'll introduce here a little bit later from Rota Engineering to speak to their technology, as well as a really insightful uh, customer showcase later on that demonstrates how they've been able to bring this technology together to the forefront. It's uh, very exciting and I, I think thought-provoking for, um, for the folks that are on the phone. I want to start off with a couple of facts. I think the ground the discussion is this, in this is, is good. Some of you may have seen, if you're, if you're participants that are familiar with the ag market, there's a publication called Farm Equipment uh, that uh, publishes information uh, monthly. And in last month's issue, just by pure coincidence, they uh, reported on a story uh, where the Boston Consulting Group had done uh, a survey regarding influential trends affecting agriculture. And in there, they talked about a lot of different things, of course. One of the main topics was pre precision farming, and that's been a hot topic for, for many years. That in and of itself is not new, but the quote that I have highlighted in here, I thought, uh, is quite pointed for this conversation. And, and, and what they say, uh, to paraphrase a little bit, is it's, it's spread, that's pre precision farming, will be enabled by the increased use of sensors, software, wireless connectivity on farming implements, thereby turning plows, planters, spreaders, sprayers, and other add-ons into intelligent equipment. Such implements will control the tractor through two-way communication, providing information about the current load, uh, for example, sensor data about the soil. And that's a really good segue for, uh, for the Gates manufacturing portion of, the, of this presentation because they're doing that, and there's other people that are doing things similar to that as well, so, so it's here. In that same article, they had some other facts regarding patent registrations. And I thought this was also very interesting. And it, they looked at the last five years of patent filings, and they've got it broken down between precision farming and seeding and fertilizer and crop protection and those, those areas. And it, what I found interesting, and it's highlighted in red, is that there were over 5,300 patent filings in and around precision and conventional equipment. And of that, 7% from, from North America dealt with uh, – uh, 70% of those were from North America, but it really goes to show you the, the sheer volume of patents. You know, that 70% in the U U.S. accounted for about 3,700 patents alone in the area of precision agriculture. Um, and that's for things like we're talking about here today. So there's one slide that's a little rudimentary. This is a slide right here. I'm going to cover some traditional uh, uh, position methods for cylinders. We've all seen this before, but if you think about it, this is kind of cylinder position 101. You know, in today's world, we still see this where we've got stroke control collars, we've got spacer collars, we've got, uh, you know, mechanical means to restrain the cylinder in a particular position. But that's really all it can do is just stop it at a set, set point, and they're not e easily adjusted. Um, some other options that are a little bit more dynamic, but still, you know, the operator has to get out and adjust those things are like stop collars that are, uh, you know, adjustable, that are maybe on a, on a dial, like a depth stop uh, valve uh, or other means such as that. Really not user-friendly from the standpoint you can't adjust it from your seat and it's not interactive and it's not going to be dynamic. And then we've got visual cues, you know, this relies on a, on a trained or skilled operator to understand where things are at and what they want and look at those visual cues and, and set uh, their parameters accordingly. And I think we've all seen examples of this as well. And it's, it's uh, been effective uh, in the history, but it's really not representative of where technology can take us today. And the, the last item there, one of the most sophisticated ones on this slide anyway, is the use of potentiometers. And they've had their place as well. Uh, they're not without uh, some of their own considerations. They are a mechanical device. They're making contact. They require 
brackets and linkages and adjustments and uh, um, and, and different things of that nature. So they, they do have their own shortcomings as well. So when we look at what does a linear position sensor give us, and we're going to talk into, in more detail about what these are and how they work in a moment, but if I kind of jump ahead a little bit and just talk about what the benefits of these are, they give us remote adjustability, and we'll talk more about that here down the road, but they allow us to uh, make adjustments on the fly because they're, they're electronic in nature. They are very repeatable and very accurate. Uh, Sometimes I've heard that brought up as a concern, you know, how accurate are they? Are they going to repeat the position exactly where it's set every time? And, and really they can. Their accuracy is, is sub-millimeter, which, you know, we can, we can joke that, you know, that is uh, far more accurate than probably the tolerance of the pins being used to pin these, you know, the, the equipment together. So the accuracy is there. They're dynamic and self-adjusting. So we'll talk again more on this a little bit later and we'll see some examples of this but what we're able to do with a sensor cylinder is feed multiple inputs into a control mechanism and have that sensor react according to those external inputs so whether it's a GPS signal and you're feeding that into a controller and augmenting your 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 uh, your, your steering with it is, is just one example uh, but other examples could be uh, Pressures and speeds and velocities could dynamically enable us to cushion a sensor, a cylinder differently. Another uh, benefit of a linear position sensor is we've got lockout and safety capabilities. Again, it requires the right electronics to accompany it, but uh, it gives us the ability to lock out a particular function if we're running at a certain speed. Um, for example, maybe if you're in highway gear and you're going down the road, you don't want to uh, allow an operator to mistakenly unfold the booms on a sprayer or something to that effect. There's, there's ways that can, um, we can deal with that through the use of a sensor cylinder because we know its position. And last but certainly not least, one of the, one of the other big benefits of linear position sensors is that they're, they're very robust. They're, they're non-contacting, they're not mechanical devices, they're solid state devices that uh, are, are if they're inside the cylinder, they're obviously very sealed from the environment. Um, so it makes them very well suited for very harsh environments and rugged terrain and inhospitable places. That some of those other mechanisms that we saw on our previous slide really aren't conducive to. And then, you know, there's a few other benefits here. A little more uh, sophistication comes into play when we talk about velocity management, but this is really where we're, we're taking it a step further. Um, We've got the ability then to control acceleration and deacceleration of the cylinder uh, to perform cushioning functions. So instead of paying for the added cost of the machine work needed inside the cylinder to do mechanical cushioning, we can do electronic and dynamic cushioning through the use of these uh, sensors and controllers and, and valves that you'd have in place. And then the dynamic stroke dampening is kind of taking that whole, to a whole other level yet again, where instead of having cushioning at a predefined position or at a certain point of the stroke begin to cushion, the dynamic stroke dampening, what I'm referring to there, is the ability to really evaluate not only where is the position, but maybe where the speed. So if you're moving very slowly, maybe you really only need to cushion the last half an inch of stroke. But if you're moving very rapidly, and you want to slow that down, maybe you need to cushion the last two inches of stroke. And again, mechanical cushioning can't do something like that, but dynamic stroke dampening in this scenario could. It gives you that level of capability. And the last thing I'll mention about the, uh, the potential benefits that the, the sensors themselves provide is that there are custom sensors available uh, with optional features to do things like pressure monitoring, temperature monitoring, and load management. And uh, the thing that I'll point out that's maybe a little bit different about doing it at the sensor level, so having it at the sensor is a benefit there. Same is true with temperature monitoring. You know, pretty much all hydraulic systems have a temperature sister, uh, sensor somewhere, but if you put it right at the, uh, uh, the cylinder, if you've got a cylinder that's, you know, oscillating back and forth and it's really not getting a cool inflow of oil in either direction, it's going to get very hot, whereas maybe your overall system won't be. Um, so again, those kinds of features are are very nice to have if you if you need them, right? 
So those are really some of the, the high-level benefits. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how the technology works, and, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Mark Hoffman with, uh, with Rota Engineering. But, but here I'll talk this much. There's really two key types of technologies that are used to, uh, uh, to determine the position of your cylinder these, for these linear positions. There's, there's the type of technology that's called magnetostrictive, and there's the kind that's called a Hall effect. And we'll get into these in a little bit more detail here. The magnetostrictive is, you know, it may look kind of complicated, the, uh, the graph on the screen, but it's a pretty simple uh, principle. And what's shown there in that picture is, is really in the, in the green uh, semicircle, uh, really represents a uh, circular magnet that's embedded into the uh, rod of the cylinder uh, down by the piston, and that's generating a magnetic field. And then the yellow tube that you see protruding through that is a, uh, uh, is a sensing element. It's a, it's a waveguide. And the way magnetostrictive works is that there's a, there's a pulse that's sent down that waveguide, and when it encounters that uh, magnetic field produced by the magnet, it essentially reflects back, and there's a strain pulse that's returned. So one analogy would be uh, similar, but yet again, a little bit different, but I think something we can all relate to is like active sonar. We've all seen the, you know, some movie, you know, Hunt for Red October or whatever, and Sean Connery says, give me one ping and one ping only. You know, that's kind of what's happening here. There's a ping going down that line, and it reflects back once it encounters that magnetic field. And through the laws of physics, we know the time it takes for that, that signal to go down and back. And the longer it takes, the further away it is. And if you ping and ping and ping, and you see uh, those times change, not only do you know where it's at, but you know the direction it's heading and the velocity that it's at. Um, sorry for that. I hit the wrong key. Um, another example or scenario that's similar to this is like a radar gun on a cop car. Again, it, it's sending out an outbound wave, it reflects off your car, and it goes back to the radar gun where it's red, and then it determines how long did it take, and after I take a couple of readings, I can determine the velocity of it. So very similar uh, principle to what's going on with magnetostrictive. We'll talk about a few features here. We see a cutaway there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the design, it's, it's very simple and robust. It's fully solid state. Again, it's non-contact. There's no moving parts to wear out uh, in terms of output signals. And, and Mark will talk about this a little bit more. We've got a lot of options, whether it be a digital signal like a, a CAN bus, ISO bus, open bus, or an analog output, whether it be a variable voltage, variable current, those kind of things. Um, it... Uh, it is capable of having redundancy built in, so there can be a, a secondary circuit board that's a redundant circuit board to process the signal. So things like maybe a steering application is very important that you know you get a you get a, a reliable reading all the time. You may want to have a uh, a redundant uh, processor on board, and that is an option. Uh, there's really no calibration steps required because again, it's based on the law of physics. You know the signal travels at a known rate of speed, so it uh, you know out of the box it knows the position of that magnet and the sensor relative to the uh, the sensing mechanism, and they're very rugged. Probably the the one downside there is to this design is that it does take up some space on the base end of the cylinder, and you can see that from the cutaway up above. You can see where the uh, electrical port is located. You can see that uh, kind of the diaphragm it's, itself that houses the electronics that is taking up a little bit of space in the cylinder. Uh, so that is one consideration with this design that, you know, if you're very space constrained, um, that, that will be a, a big consideration. Or if you've got an existing design that you want to have a, you know, a drop-in alternative that is a sensor cylinder, um, that might be challenging to do with this, uh, this particular design. But if you've got the room, you've got the space, then it's, it's not, a, not a consideration. So uh, just something to, to bear in mind. The last thing I'll, I'll mention on the magnetostrictive is just, just an example of one that we've done. Uh, this particular sensor cylinder was used on a uh, self-propelled sprayer that uh, uh, it is a steering cylinder, so it, it was uh, um, steering the, uh, the unit down the field. Um, 
because of what I mentioned earlier, they did want to have redundancy. So this particular sensor has got dual circuit boards on it. And even in this case, if you look in the lower left-hand side, you'll see that it had dual um, connectors. So there was actually dual redundant wiring looms that went to this uh, to carry that signal back to the processing unit. So very robust design in that regard. Um, and it's one that uh, one that we've done here in the in the last year or so. That is really the amount of the overview that I was going to provide on uh, magnetostrictive design. Uh, the next section is going to be uh, speaking to the Hall effect sensors. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mark Hoffman, who joins us uh, from Rota Engineering, and he's going to cover the next. Uh, six or seven slides or so. So here, here he is. Hello, everybody. This is Mark Hoffman with Rota Engineering. I'd like to uh, thank everybody uh, from Prince uh, for inviting me here today to participate in this webinar. And what I'd like to do is talk more about the Hall Effect technology, which is the main technology that Rota uses. And I'll talk a little bit about the different electrical outputs that you can choose, why you may use that one versus another. So the slide that I've pulled up is uh, basically gives you an idea of how the Hall Effect technology works. On the next slide, you'll actually see how on the Hall chips are on a printed circuit board that lives inside of a pressure containment vessel that lives inside or outside of your hydraulic cylinder. So what happens is as a magnet moves, it communicates with the Hall chips causing a voltage output change. The microprocessor understands that and gives the proportional output for your controller. So some of the things we want to make sure to bring out, the industry has matured to the point where people looking at this technology want to make sure that they have an absolute sensor. That means that if electrical power is lost and the cylinder moves, as soon as you reestablish electrical power, the sensor knows where it is. So that's absolute. It's a non-contact technology. So again, unlike some of the technologies in the past, there are no moving parts that you have to be worried about any cycle life. That's why we're able to give you a 60-year MTBF on our sensors. These are also a non-ratiometric sensor. So what that means, again, some of the older technologies, if you had a power supply that fluctuated, even though your cylinder has not moved, the electrical output of the sensor would fluctuate with the power supply if it was a ratiometric sensor. So there again, the Hall Effect technology, we can actually take that variable power supply that goes up and down. It doesn't matter. We internally regulate and use the appropriate power that we need to run the sensor. This was the slide that I was alluding to. As you see in the upper right-hand corner, you see the green PC board. All of those Hall chips are on the PC board, and then they are put inside of a rod that that is where they would live. Now, to break down what Todd was talking a little bit about, we also have the simple and robust construction. Uh, we talk about compact, and what compact means to you that we believe that in 95% of the applications, our sensor can go inside an existing cylinder without changing the pin to pin dimensions. So that's what we're really trying to get at with the feature is the compactness, but what it gets for you is maintaining that holy grail of the pin-to-pin -pin dimensions. We've, we've got the digital and analog outputs we'll talk about a little bit later. High speed, our sensors give out, uh, the analog sensors are outputting a signal 1,600 times a second. So they are very fast sensors. We jump down to advantages as far as the high vibration. We believe that if you look at this type of technology, there's 
at least a three times spread of better performance with the Hall effect under vibration capabilities. And we list some specifications there that were actually done over an 18 hour period. So again, we're talking about a lot of vibration capability in the Hall effect technology. Shock resistant, we've done tests for applications where we've only required to test the two meters, but we took it to the next step and actually drop tested these at 10 meters and they still continue to work. We are an engineering company, so there's a lot of things that we do that are outside of standard designs that you might see. For example, one thing is we can design sensors up to 130 feet in length. We've got the ability to also do redundancy. We can also add in on digital sensors, velocity and temperature. So for example, if you had an application that was drilling, there are several companies that make use of velocity data to understand if they are in soft rock or hard rock, and that's good input back to the operator. Uh, considerations, uh, one thing that I always talk and stress to people about is protecting the area where either the M12 connector or the cable comes out of the cylinder. That is an area that you really need to look at and really focus on protecting that area. Here's a design where we were used in a print cylinder for a detasseler. So as you can see with our design, it is installed from the rod end and simply screwed into the clevis end. And in this application, it was a very small cylinder. It's a two inch bore, 10 inch stroke design. And if I'm not mistaken, it did not increase the pin to pin dimensions on that design. Something that we also do, there were years, uh, several years ago, we continually look at how do we continue to move this technology throughout the hydraulic cylinder application. And one of the things that we found is on double-ended cylinders, obviously you cannot put a sensor inside. So we have actually patented a technology where the magnet resides inside of the cylinder and the sensor lives outside of the cylinder. Now, to most of you that have been in the industry for any years, that concept is very prevalent in the pneumatic industry, but that's where you're dealing with a composite material. You're not dealing with high pressures, so you can see through a non-magnetic material or a comp composite material very easily. We're able to see through the existing carbon steel wall of your existing cylinder today and communicate with those same hull chips mounted externally. So some of the considerations, we believe in this application about 50% of the cylinders are going to need to increase in size because of the magnet required inside. But again, that's something that can be worked on with uh, Prince and ourselves to see if we could provide a design that fits your requirements. Also, very long stroke cylinders. Once you start to go past 30 inches, this external technology becomes a very viable economical solution because what you're doing at those longer strokes, you're getting rid of the cost of gun drilling. So that is a cost to be considered. So the longer the cylinder, the more it costs to gun drill it so that this external technology makes more and more economical sense. One of the things too is uh, we've got the comment, there is a limit on cylinder tube wall thickness. So right now we're doing about a maximum of a six inch bore with a half inch wall. But if you look at the cylinders out there, that covers, I'd say, somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of the, the volume of sensors out in the industry. Here is a real life world example of the external technology. So the red arrow actually points to our sensor. Uh, it turns out it was actually spray painted during the process of painting the cylinder. So normally it's a nice shiny uh, metal, but in this case it's been painted black. It's very hard to detect. But this is a double-ended steering cylinder on a combine. So that's the technology or the type of cylinder we've discussed that an internal sensor cannot live in that environment. 
So the magnet is simply put in the piston, the sensor is external, and it still communicates uh, digital or analog outputs back to the controller. This is a nice graph for your use, uh, a nice table that Prince and uh, Rhoda worked on to just give you the different model numbers out there, some of the, the pros and cons. I think what most people will tend to do is kind of shift over to the right, look at economics, look at the dollar signs, and as we all typically were driven to the bottom, that's just our human nature. So you just start looking at those technologies and, and what they offer. And again, that's my role as a sales engineer is to work with the folks to come out with the best solution that we want, might be able to provide. So some of the considerations you, you come into play is obviously what do you have on your system today? Some of you may think, and again, if, you, if you're a manufacturer out there of actual, uh, say, tractors or combines that it already has a, a diesel engine on it, you might think, well, I don't have a controller. But in reality, what's, what we're seeing is a lot of Tier 4 compliant engines have had to employ ECU or electronic control units that are taking multiple sensor inputs, usually from around the engine, to make sure that they're adhering to the, the various requirements. Well, now that the Tier 4 requirements here, we've got the ECUs on the equipment, those are controllers that you can actually input the sensor signal to actually start making use of that. And when we talk about wiring harnesses, that's another thing. You start looking at how many sensors you have. So if you've got just a couple sensors, maybe you want to keep it analog and run hard wires dedicated back to that ECU, or maybe you want to employ a CAN network. So some of the things that you would look at are, okay, if I don't have that ECU, do I want to start looking at some of the, the technologies that are out there? Some of the ones that we hear of quite a bit are the Parker ICANN or the Danfoss Plus One, but there's a multitude out there that are uh, specially made for your applications. As you're going to see a little bit further in the presentation, maybe a smartphone or a tablet can be used for control purposes. There's even opportunities just for digital panel meters. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. One of our applications was with a military vehicle that would uh, basically it was like a hook load truck that would go out. And you've seen these type where they pull up the big garbage disposal up on the back. Well, this application was a military application, and that big container was full of ammunition. And for their application, they just had multiple lights on the dash, and each time that cylinder passed a certain predetermined spot, it brought a light on on the dash for that operator. Likewise, with digital panel meters, if you just need a digital display of maybe the depth, you could have that. So you can be as basic or as complex as you need to be. We'll talk a little bit about signal options, but I think the next slide is going to bring that home better. Power options with rotor sensors, we have anywhere from 4 volts up to 32 volts. So again, we talked about sensors that are non-ratio metric. So we can take a, a power supply that will tend to float up and down, and it doesn't affect the output of our sensors. So with the sensor output and wiring considerations, some of the things to start thinking about is obviously what you have existing, but if you want to talk about voltage outputs, the way I, I kind of list this to people is a voltage sensor is the easiest to troubleshoot. That is its upside. The downside is you may only want to run that signal 100 feet, and again, that's dependent upon electrical noise in the area. So if electrical noise is an issue, then you may want to go to a current output sensor that the maximum by the IEEE standard, or at least the last time I looked, was 4,000 feet. So you can run that signal a lot further. It's actually much better from a noise immunity standpoint because it's hard to interject a mechanical or an electrical noise onto a current loop because that 
electrical noise is generally shown up as voltage. The downside of that is it doesn't operate as low as 4 volts like a voltage-powered sensor. Then you can jump into the CAN bus or the, the various digital output sensors. The advantages there are maybe less wiring because you basically run, the, run these in a ring topology. So you may have one large loop with multiple sensors hanging off of that. But then that comes back to an issue you really have stepped up in technology and it almost requires somebody that's specialized in that field because there are a lot of parameters. It's not as simple as a voltage sensor. So again, you're going to see in the, the next couple slides, the presentation goes to the next step of, okay, I don't really want to deal with all that wiring between, say, the implement and the tractor. What could I do then? And I think you're going to see a great uh, piece of technology where wireless is used in this application. And I will turn it back over to Todd. Thank you very much. All right. Let's talk about cost considerations here for a second. I know that's always on everybody's mind. Um, a couple of cost drivers we'll go through. Uh, the cost of the sensor itself is going to vary more by volume than it does length. I think that's just an important important detail that uh, that we make known out there. Um, you know, if you have a, a six-inch long cylinder that, or a, a sensor that's six inches long and you need to have, uh, compare that against a, a sensor that's 24 inches long, the 24-inch long sensor is not going to be four times more experience, uh, more expensive. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Uh, it's just going to be marginally more expensive. But what really does drive the cost, uh, as we see a lot of times in manufacturing, is, is the volume in which these are being purchased in. So uh, think, think volume when you think, think sensors, you know, for running very, very small quantities, they're just not going to be as cost effective as if we have some volume to work with. So bear, bear that in mind. The other thing we've got to be cons considerate of is uh, the machining cost in the, in the cylinder itself. And just to, just to point out a few things here, you know, we've got uh, machining to house the magnet because we've got a magnet in all these. Uh, we've got to have a, a port to route the, uh, the wirings and the wiring connector to. So there's a bit of machining there. Uh, one of the biggest drivers is, is to gun drill the rod or deep hole drill the rod to accept the uh, sensor tube that's got to fit up inside of it. Uh, so it's a fairly deep hole sometimes and uh, fairly strong material that, that, that may be going in. So that's a consideration. And then obviously we do have a little bit of machining and threading to house the sensor assembly. So those are those are some machining steps. And then from a material standpoint, we may have to increase the rod size on the cylinder, or we may have to look at using alternative material that maybe is a higher strength material. And why that's the case is because since we are drilling out the center of that rod, we're losing some of that material cross-section. And depending upon what the loads and the strokes are, that may require us to use either larger material or higher strength material, and, in, and really in either case that is going to drive cost a bit. So those are the things that we consider, uh, you know, when we're building a, a cylinder with a sensor in it, we have to be mindful of those things when we, um, when we quote those out. And then last but not least, I do want to point out that you know, at Prince we are testing every one of these uh, sensor cylinders when they go out the door. Uh, so we do test that on the, on the test bench. We do test all the, the cylinders before they go out the door, so there's an added test step of uh, testing the actual sensor. last thing you want to do is get a, a, a nice shiny sensor with, or cylinder with a built-in sensor and uh, have it not function. And then the last thing on this page, you know, it's really hard to provide a pricing example, but I really felt compelled to, to try to give some basis for this so that you, you have some idea what we're talking about here. So I, I drew this, uh, this correlation. You could take a, a standard tie rod cylinder, you know, a three by six chrome tie rod, you know, it's going to run about a hundred bucks just as a broad brush. And that same cylinder with a sensor in it, is going to run about three hundred dollars, and you know the difference there is the sensor itself, and then all the machining and the testing that we mentioned up above, and that is assuming a hundred piece quantity. All right, real world sensor uses. This is where I'm going to start to transition over to Andy Gates at Gates Manufacturing here in just a second. But uh, right before I do that, here's just one slide. It's a, it's a little outdated actually, from probably six, nine, twelve months ago. 
but these are some of the companies out there that are using sensors, uh, and there's a lot, lot more than this. Um, the a uh, couple of them we've even seen uh, seen in the deck here. I think that uh, double-ended uh, steering cylinder was off that uh, case combine or something very similar to that. So the future is here, and it's, and it's being actively deployed throughout ag and construction and forestry uh, and, and all sorts of places. So with that said, I'm going to transition to Andy Gates from Gates Manufacturing. And Mike Boshin, if you, if you haven't already, if you would please unmute his line so he's able to speak. I'm going to let Andy talk next about, the, uh, um, about what they've done, which I think is very creative um, and really thought-provoking for, I think, all of us on the phone. Uh, so with that said, Andy, if you, can, uh, if you can now talk, please take it away. Sure. Can you hear me fine? I can. Okay, very good. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to give uh, or thank Prince and uh, Rhoda both for um, responding to a request we had um, to add some position sensing on our piece of equipment. Um, just a brief uh, background in our company. We're a, about a 30-year-old family, smaller base manufacturing company in North Dakota that builds um, kind of light and medium uh, tillage equipment. Um, the one you see on the screen right now is a um, actually the largest piece of uh a uh, disc that we manufacture so in the vertical tillage category. This uh, particular one is 56 feet. Um, currently has about 40 hydraulic cylinders on it, 1,000 feet of hose. Um, and so um, we're doing about uh, three degrees of uh, adjustability or three, um, uh, we uh, hydraulically adjust the front row of uh, disc gangs and the rear row of disc, disc rings in the past uh, separately, and then you have depth uh, adjustment and and so on and so forth. So um, next slide, please. Um, we have uh, decided to pursue, at somewhat at a, at a customer request, a more easily adjustable system. Um, uh, we have uh, put in for a... Uh, a utility patent on this, and, it, and it, so far we haven't come up with anything fancier the name than what uh, the technical description kind of is, and that's a dynamic uh, adjust soil conditioning system. And so what we're do we're doing is giving the operator the ability to, um, at the touch of a button, program the machine and then retain those program settings and use various ones within the same uh uh, field um, and that's been very common in the past with the um, the hydraulic valves. They've been able to adjust the machine also, but it's just not literally as pre precise and not uh, as repeatable. So what we're starting off with is using the sensor cylinders to adjust the angle of the gangs, and we're going from zero to 15 degrees on that. And uh, the reason we're doing that is so we can provide. Um, a significant amount of uh, variation in the tillage because as we all know that fields aren't uh, necessarily consistent from the amount of residue or the type of conditions in the field. And uh, we're doing that uh, through a controller on the piece of equipment um, that is, uh, um, you know, picking up the sensor signal um, from the, the print cylinders. And then we're using a, a Wi-Fi based uh, tablet uh, application to um, run the controller on the unit. Next slide, please. Um, in the upper left-hand corner um, is uh, the picture of the cylinder when we had uh, a mechanical gauge to look at or that uh, basically had a rod on it that, that showed you position. And, and no matter what you do with these gauges and how accurate, I mean, it's still an issue of operators you know, um, interpretation of where that uh, 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 potentially is on the, the the gauge and the repeatability of that. And then um, this particular piece of tillage equipment is used in some pretty um, wet conditions, so there's a lot of mud on the piece of equipment that builds up, and just the visibility and repeatability is tough. Um, before even the hydraulic cylinders, we had mechanical um, stops that you basically uh, – uh, went out and pulled a pin and adjust those uh, gangs too. Uh, there again, you, you know, tractor operators getting out of a tractor cab. The middle picture in the top row, um, this spring uh, we did the project over the winter, and this spring we wanted to get a, a piece of equipment in the field very quickly. 
So we built, um, you know, basically boxes that have the potentiometer type uh, rotary uh, um, uh, unit inside and then the mechanical linkage to run it. You know, it's doable. It worked. Um, but I was adamant about not wanting to release of a piece of equipment that uh, had the maximum amount of robustness that there was, um, the, you know, with available technology. And so with that, we um, tr transitioned to the, the upper right picture, picture which shows uh, the actual cylinder that Prince built for us. Um, right, to really complement Prince on the response, we kind of, we set up a meeting and had to come down and kind of do a little bit of a sales pitch on our application. Um, and the, the initial conversations were that we needed to change the rod diameter in order to um, accomplish what we wanted to do with the, the position sense uh, rotor unit inside. And we, we really we didn't want to do that because of backwards compatibility and our system is plumbed so that we're doing a push-pull on the same volume of cylinders. In other words, we fit them in series and we um, use the oil from the base end to the base end of the cylinder. So that's feeding the same volume and rod end to rod end. So, you know, I wanted to be able to install the system on units we already have in the field as well as new production. And, uh, you know, Prince responded to that. Um, that's where a, a, an alternative material was selected um, for the cylinder rod, um, higher strength and, uh, and and responded in a very quick fashion. I will say I don't know. I think our the end of April might have been our meeting, and they had us prototype cylinders to us, um, essentially by the beginning of June. So I I really want to compliment uh, them on their the response. Um, the bottom picture in that um, this slide shows a bunch of red arrows. We envision a piece of equipment down the road that's going to have about 70 hydraulic cylinders on it. Um, 31 of them, uh, which could be um, position sensing cylinders. So, you know, we're delving into this technology. There's a value proposition there for the customer that um, seems to be so far very uh, accepted and that um, they like to do it um, from the tractor cab. And so consequently, um, one way to do that is with the system we have here. Next slide. Um, there again, the, the, the linkage in the control box um, is what we put on there first. Um, we did have, uh, the, the, since we knew that housing was temporary, um, you know, it's tough to seal those up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the pieces of equipment get extremely dirty. Um, our, this particular piece of tillage equipment performs quite well in, uh, in wet conditions and our primary market territory is North Dakota, up into Canada, some into South Dakota, Montana, and Minnesota, and we've had some some pretty uh, some pretty wet springs the last really the last uh, ten years uh, around here. So, um, and 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 the re redundant or the robustness of the system, um, I, I was just adamant about going to a, an internal uh, sensor application. Next slide. So here's the you know cutaway of the cylinder itself. Um, uh, I'll get more into the how the system is set up here in a little bit. Um, essentially, it's a three by six double reface cylinder. So we do a push pull type application. We reface those cylinders on both ends. The same cylinders used throughout the, all of the the that uh, the gang adjust um, on the the whole machine. And then we um, uh, were able to, re to maintain the rod size in this particular application. So we had backwards compatibility for all of our field volume. Next slide. So here's a picture of kind of the actual components of the system themselves. Um, we have a controller bottom middle uh, uh, picture uh, controller on the machine that's um, wireless essentially. We do try, draw the power from the tractor to provide the 12 volt um, to the controller itself as well as uh, um, you know, the controller sending out the power to the individual cylinders. We're receiving back a signal that's from a quarter of 1.25 to 4.75 volts for the position itself. Um, so essentially we're running proportional valves in the, the right-hand picture on the screen. We have, this is on the largest piece of equipment. We have it split up into quadrants. So we're running four proportional valves on the gain adjustment uh, side of it and uh, essentially series plumbing three of the cylinders on the 
uh, together on, on each of the quadrants of the machine. There's a total of 12 gangs. And like I said, we're running three, um, three uh, sensor, or sensor cylinders in each quadrant. And the reason we did uh, three sensor cylinders, um, people might ask, why, why would you put three on all of them when you're uh, feeding them in series and you're mechanically um, uh, adjusting? Um, I wanted them for redundancy. So we're putting a sensor cylinder in every position. And if we have an issue where um, we pull off a wire or break a wire, our, the way we programmed our system is instead of averaging three cylinders out, we drop down to two and then to one. So we have a lot of redundancy in the system in order to keep it running in the uh, uh, in the field and not have to have an operator stop and, and, and incur any downtime. You know, they can fix that uh, particular issue later. And our system actually detects that and tells the operator what's going on. A uh, middle screen in the, the middle picture in the top is uh, the, the tablet application itself. Um, we initially did an Android based application and we're, um, you know, concurrently um, here, uh, very near release, I'm um, doing the, the Apple iOS system besides that. Uh, next slide. The reason we had picked uh, uh, Wi Fi also instead of like a Bluetooth was the robustness of the connection and the distance that we're able to connect. We have some customers that'll hook a, uh, a tow between a tank in between our piece of equipment and the tractor to apply fertilizer. And uh, so consequently, they, they end up a considerable amount of distance back and the wireless system is pretty reliable up to 300 feet. Um, I'll just go through the, the bullet points on the application side of it is uh, how this uh, came about is that essentially we had customers asking for a better gauge and preferably something that was in the cab that was digital. Um, so really that was the initial request, but I'm thinking, well, if we head that down that road, we need probably to offer something more than just a digital gauge. And so we started to ask our customers what they really wanted. And, and you know, using kind of a y, five Y uh, concept, they, they turns out they wanted, you know, uh, a user-friendly system for less competent operators. In other words, you know, as the farm manager or the, the producer themselves, they're probably not the one in the pieces of a tillage equipment doing the seedbed preparation in the spring or potentially also in the fall um, doing the residue management, um, uh, you know, residue management passes. So they said that, you know, something where I could tell a bot operator, you know, in these type of conditions, either hit a button and, and uh, have it uh, adjust automatically. Repeatability was very important. Um, so we're actually... Um, adjusting the stroke of that six inch to cylinder about four tenths of an inch at a time. Um, and so we're achieving half a degree of control on the physical angle of the, the gains that we're looking at. And we're running it to a, a range of zero to 15 degrees. Uh, durability was extremely important. Again, um, you know, we put multiple sensor cylinders on there and have programming in place so that if something happens to one of those cylinders, from an electronic uh, sensing perspective, you know, it averages out uh, um, the, the remaining ones. Ease of use, um, you know, turning around and looking back at gauges and stuff like that is is worked in the past, but they they desired something that was easier to do. So having a tablet conveniently easy to see right in the cab, um, you know, met met that error detection. If we do have a a, a mechanical failure. And the, and the cylinder comes out of phase, then we have visible cues on the, the, the application itself or on the piece of equipment on the screen where it'll, it'll show the operator that so the, uh, you know, then they can, you know, if they need to physically get out and, and check something, they can. And then we also have auto correction features. So if we do have some drift in the settings on the, 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 the hydraulics, you know, the system with the proportional valves running the, the hydraulic dual flow or dual, it'll automatically bring it back into correction. And there again, those are all system parameters that we can um, set. Um, so it's, in essence, if it were to drift three tenths of a degree, it'll, it'll automatically correct it back to the set point position. And then um, with the, you know, technology that exists out there, a lot of tablets now have embedded uh, GPS. Um, we can use the controller itself to turn on and track acres, um, track GPS position and the settings on the piece of equipment. So essentially we're, we're providing tillage mapping also with this um, system. 
Um, so, you know, they'll be able to upload that to a cloud and overlay those maps on, um, you know, what they're doing potentially from a seeding perspective and then certainly from yield mapping off of combines. Um, so we, we came up with a system and, you know, uh, met the initial criteria that the customers were looking for. Um, really the value proposition to the customer and, and the reason for us doing it, um, you know, is essentially increase our sales offer something that's, in my opinion, the first uh, piece of truly precision uh, tillage equipment. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of, at this point, kind of do a little bit of segue. Uh, it's pretty simple off the bat or initially, but what we envision and what we have in our patent application is a pretty advanced system where we intend to put sensors um, to read ground, the residue conditions and the amount of residue on a field, and then dynamically or automatically adjust the piece of equipment according to what um, you know the 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 farm uh, producer or farm manager wants for output in other words if we read residue in front of the tractor and have that piece of tillage equipment adjust so that he knows that in the fall I want to I want 40 percent black dirt showing I want the rest of it to be there for um, erosion control and um, you know, I just, that's the amount of residue that I like to have left. He'll be able to, down the road, we don't have offered it uh, yet today, be able to select that and to do that so that um, it takes the operator even out of the, the equation from a visual perspective, trying to adjust the piece of equipment. Um, so we're, we're basically, um, you know, using the combination of technology that exists, you know, in hydraulics and uh, electronics and, uh, you know, uh, on a piece of tillage equipment to, to, to adapt it or control it. Um, just an example, uh, you know, our, our system added between 10 and 15 percent to the price tag, list price tag of a piece of equipment. So the tillage of, uh, um, piece of equipment you saw on the screens earlier you know, they range from, depending on size, 100 to $200,000 on list price. And this system is going to add 10 to 30,000, depending on how many options and ultimately how many sensors um, we end up putting on there for, for uh, you know, providing control of the, a piece of equipment. Uh, next slide. Um, why did we choose Prince Manufacturing? I'll, I'll go back a few years. And we were having, when things were ramping up in the industry quite uh, rapidly, having pr problems actually physically getting our product from our, our what was then our current cylinder supplier. So I personally went and did a you know 100 point quality audit on Prince and asked them about their delivery and manufacturing process and lead time capabilities, and chose them as a supplier about three years ago, and and have shifted a lot of our uh, pretty much all of our cylinder. Um, supply over to prints. Um, so it started with that. And then um, as we got to know their technical uh, people and uh, Todd is a rep and, uh, you know, um, now Tim Prince is our rep, um, willing to listen to the customer and work with them on, you know, uh, you know, be, being a supplier that's going to push the envelope. And in the sensor situation, that's exactly what was done. Um, we met with Prince and um, uh, in both engineering and you know from the from the sales side, we articulated what our vision was for needing a, a real durable, reasonable cost, accurate position sensor cylinder, and um, you know have it well protected. And inside the cylinders, you know, there's nothing better than that, in my opinion. And and basically, Prince responded with um, you know initial batch of cylinders for uh, you know a prototype unit. Um, and and repeatable manufacturing times or, or, or re, uh, reasonable lead times on a on a second batch of products so that we could introduce this product in the the time frame that we desired and and you know in my opinion you can't ask for a better uh, supplier than that that responds in that particular way so you know the, their their response is hopefully going to reward both both of our companies or all three of them you know with Roto being involved and. Um, like I said, one piece of tillage equipment could end up with 31 of these positions and cylinders on it for all of the things that we envision doing, um, you know, from a control perspective. And I believe that might be the last uh, last slide that I have. Yeah, it, it is. And thank you, Andy. I really appreciate that. And I, I think uh, our participants found, uh, you know, what you're doing to be very insightful and thought-provoking and, and yet, like what we discussed uh, a couple times now, 
you're really bringing together readily available technology, which is a really cool and exciting piece that uh, you, know, you talk about Wi-Fi and the tablet app and the sensor cylinders. They're, they're today's technology. It's not tomorrow's dreams. It's, it's here and now. So I, uh, two slides I want to cover, and then, and then we'll be wrapping up. So uh, we'll try to keep this on, on time here. Um, I want to talk just real briefly about cost justification. You know, to recap some of the things that we talked about earlier and throughout this presentation, you know, if you have needs that are going to be uh, solved and met by using a sensor cylinder, you know, consider that, research it, understand it, talk to us, we will help you, and we'll come up with a solution. So, you know, if you need that dynamic adjustment, if you need some lockout and safety features, sequence logic, um, you, something, you know, very dynamically, what with like with what Andy just described, um, you know, think about using a sensor cylinder. It, it could be the right solution for you. Um, you know, there, there's other solutions out there and things that we've all been exposed to, and, I, and I'll make quick mention of those. But, you know, we talked about uh, sequencing a little bit. You know, we do have sequence valves that can do some basic sequencing, and they're, they're good in certain situations, but you bring into play uh, back pressure in your hydraulic system and other things like that, and then they lose some of their sensitivity or repeatability as to when they, when they kick in. Um, we talked a little briefly about potentiometers, and, uh, you know, they can provide a lot of the same electronic uh, monitoring capabilities, but they're not without some of their own considerations. Again, they are mechanical. They will wear out. They do require fabrication of, you know, brackets and weldments and linkages and things like that. So if you're, if you're looking at that and you're looking at a sensor cylinder, just make sure you, you look at all those components and all those costs and, and some of the risks that you still have at the end of the day with uh, linkages and, and things like that being, being external. And then uh, I guess the third point there, restrictive cushioning. Uh, and we make a lot of cylinders with internal cushioning, and that's, you know, fit for function uh, okay sometimes. But it is kind of reactive. It's not going to be dynamic. You know, it's going to kick in at a certain position in the stroke, and you're going to have limitations on how much you can cushion. Uh, it's not going to vary with speed and pressure and, and things like that. So it, it's got its place, but it certainly has its limitations relative to the functionality that we've got here. And that really leads us to that final point is, you know, sensor cylinders really can accomplish all these things and be very robust, very durable, um, and offer uh, just more capabilities than uh, any one of those things can on their own. The last slide that I will leave everybody with here um, is Think Prints. Um, Andy had a great testimonial for you today. Um, hopefully that will, will ring true and, uh, and, and mean something to you. But, you know, to say it again, we have got a lot of experience with both uh, magnetostrictive and the Hall Effect technology uh, with Rota, with MTS, Ballas, and other, other suppliers out there of that technology. Uh, we've got the capacity or we're capable of incorporating sensors into existing designs, particularly when you look at the tie rod cylinders that we offer. We can drop a Rota sensor in there and uh, retain the pin-to-pin the -pin dimensions, and oftentimes can do that in a welded cylinder as well. Uh, we've got a lot of experience in a wide range of sizes, so if you're looking for a smaller cylinder or a very large bore cylinder or a very long cylinder, um, because of our structure and uh, the breadth of our product line and our five manufacturing facilities, we've got a, a full breadth of capabilities from small to large, short to long. We did uh, rapid prototyping with what Andy described earlier. We were on a very tight timeline there, but we were able to do that. Uh, we, we can leverage our R&D lab services from time to time to do things like that. Um, so we can get it to you fast, or we'll certainly work as hard as we can to meet your, meet your timeline. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the ag-related uh, uh, items today, but that doesn't mean that we haven't done an awful lot of this in the oil and energy markets or with the military. Um, so we've not just done this with hay and forage or tillage, but it's been in construction, oil, gas, and, and other places. And last thing there, uh, strong partnership with our sensor suppliers. Uh, we work very closely with all of them. And I think one testament to that today is the fact that, uh, you know, Mark Hoffman from, uh, from Rota Engineering was, was on the phone and participated in this as well. So with that said, that really concludes the presentation.